Hey guys, so I'm going to be doing another reading. Um, the first one, chapter 17, is called I've Changed My Mind. It's only four pages, so I'm also going to read chapter 18, which is called... It was a dark and stormy night. So, let's get started. Also, I apologize for the bad lighting. And first, if you forget what happened, which you probably would because I haven't done one in such a while, Cass, oh, if you haven't seen any of these readings before and you just stumbled across it, go to the first one on my channel. Also, subscribe. But, yeah, go to the first one on my channel so you can read from the beginning. But, um... Cass just called in as one of the other skeleton sisters pretending to be Amber so she can get an appointment at the Midnight Sun. So I'm going to read chapter 17 called I've Changed My Mind. So let's get started. Or maybe I should say I've come to my senses. Rather than continuing to narrate the adventures of Cass and Max Ernest, I'm going to end this book here while they're still safe. More importantly, while you're still safe. I know you're angry with me. You've read this far. You feel you've earned the right to know how the story ends. Go ahead, laugh, scream, cry, throw the book at the wall. If you knew, well, if you knew, well, there's the rub, you don't know, do you? Wait, if you knew, well, there's the rub, you don't know, do you? If you knew the truth, I was going to say, if you knew everything this story entails, all those grisly, gruesome facts, all those horrible, harrowing details, you'd thank me for sparing you. Alas, since you don't know, you will go to your grave hating me, thinking I am your enemy, when for the first time I'm acting like a friend. Just kidding. I, um, happily, you don't know how to find me. If you did, no, I have no doubt, you would try to bribe me to finish this story. I know how you are. I know how I am, too. I am very susceptible, susceptible to bribes. As you've probably noticed, I have no self-control whatsoever. I like chocolate best, but I also have a fondness for cheese. A fondness for cheese. For instance, if you were pe to pass under my nose a very ripe brie, you might think the brie... Br brie? Brie? I don't know. B R I. You might think the brie was gross and stinky, but you would be wrong. Oh, so wrong. And you tempted me with a bite, only to tell me the price of the bite was continuing on my story. Well, I'm afraid I might start writing without a moment's thought. Now, if you were to hand me, say, a piece of chocolate, dark as night, European in origin, with a very high percentage of cocoa, don't forget that high percentage of cocoa, well, there's no saying what I would do, or wouldn't. As a matter of fact, it just so happens that I've been saving for a special occasion a piece of chocolate very much like the one I described. Right now, it's sitting high up on a shelf that I can't reach without, that I can't reach without a ladder. I put it there so I wouldn't eat it without first fully considering the matter. I must admit, I've never wanted it more than I do now. The chocolate on my shelf is of the finest quality. I won't mention the brand here. That's the kind of information that could help enemies track me down. Trust me though, it's not cheap. Many cocoa beans have given their lives to make that chocolate. I can practically taste it now. Hmm, what must I do in order to eat it? It would be wrong to eat the chocolate without offering you something in return. I'm not kind of per I'm not the kind of person who accepts a bribe and then pretends he doesn't know what the bribe means. Where's the honor in that? In short, if I want to eat the chocolate, I must keep writing. What an awful, awful choice. On the other side, I renounce the chocolate, stay healthy and trim, and put an end to this reckless tale telling. Or on the other side, I climb up the ladder, feast on chocolate, and then, full of sugar and guilt, I continue my story, knowing I'm possibly sentencing you to a fate worse than death. Actually, put like that, the choice is pretty easy. I'll be right back. That's the end of chapter 17. I think that's a really funny chapter. Chapter 18 is called, It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. Really, it was. Dark and stormy. As if the weather itself had conspired to turn our tale into a ghost story. Or as if, and this seems slightly more plausible, Miss Mave somehow controlled this over... The controlled the skies and was using them to ob using them to obscure the events of the evening. In any case, the weather makes my job easier. It creates a proper mood, and it eliminates the need to hide certain facts, like the location of the street corner on which Cass was waiting. With all that rain, you could hardly have seen it there anyway. You could hardly have seen her anyway. For Cass, sadly, the weather didn't make things any easier, only wetter and colder. Teeth chattering, she stood under an empty street. She stood under a street lamp, clutching her backpack to her chest for warmth. Not that it was much help. The backpack was no drier than her clothing. 
<clears throat> it had been difficult figuring out to what, what, what to wear. After her phone conversation with Miss Mauvais, Cass had gone back to home, back home again and rifled through her mother's closets. She even tried on a dress for the first time in over a year. But despite her recent growth spurt, she still looked like she was playing dress up when she put on her mother's clothes. She'd also considered borrowing Amber's honorary skeleton sister t-shirt, but she couldn't bring herself to call and ask for it. Plus, Cass realized a real skeleton sister probably w wouldn't wear the t-shirt anyway. Finally, she chose to wear her usual jeans and a sweatshirt, but she modified the outfit with a pair of furry boots her mother had bought for, had mother had bought for one of her never-taken ski trips. They didn't look exactly like the fuzzy boots that Amber and her friends wore, but they were close enough. I know, at the beginning of this book, I told you Cass would never wear boots like those. I was forgetting she might wear them as part of a disguise. Now she regretted the boots. Not only were they too big, they were soaked through. Her feet sloshed around in them, and they splattered when she walked. She felt like Bigfoot. Her other new accessories were... Her other new accessory was equally impractical for the weather. A pair of sunglasses. But even Cass knew that celebrities wore sunglasses all the time, indoors as well and out. Also, they helped disguise their face, which presumably is why celebrities wear them. Had Cass asked me, I would have told her what I always tell who people tell people who are trying to go incognito. Lose the shades. They only make you look more conspicuous. Cass felt certain that neither Miss Mauve nor Dr. L would recognize her. They had seen her face for only a second, but it was best to be careful. Her backpack, it goes without saying, she never considered leaving, never mind whether a skeleton sister would have worn it or not. Cass thought wistfully about the hot pot of tea that Grandpa Larry would undoubtedly be making on a rainy night like this one. She wished she'd stopped at the fire station for a cup before heading out to meet the Midnight Sun limousine. Instead, she phoned her grandfather's um, and told them she was staying overnight at Max Ernest's house to work on their volcano experiment, for which the due date kept being conveniently postponed. She slept there all the time, she added, and her mother had already spoken to Max Ernest's parents, so there was no reason to ask her mother's permission. Her grandfather asked a few questions and demanded Max Ernest's phone number, but they were still feeling so guilty for making her upset about the symphony of smells that they hadn't given her much trouble. The hardest part was having to listen to Grandpa Larry and Grandpa Wayne argue about whether she should make her volcano erupt with Alka-Seltzer or dry ice. You trust me, right? Cass had asked. She felt a little guilty herself, playing on their guilt, but she needed to get off the phone. Of course we do, they assured her. Then she had called her mother and told her pretty much the same thing, except to her mother she said it was your grandfather's who had spoken to Max and his parents, so there's no reason to phone them. And don't call me at nine tonight, okay? Cass asked. Cass added, Max Ernest and I are going to be working. Just don't stay up too late, said her mother. All right, Cass? Uh-huh. Promise? Uh-huh. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yes, Mom. Yes, what? Yes, I promise. Okay, I love you. Okay, I love you. Me too. Me too what? I love you too. Sheesh. Although she and Max Ernest weren't collaborators anymore, and it was sort of cheating to ask for his help, Cass had no choice but to call him too. She had to warn that him, that him that he might hear from her grandfathers or even from her mom. She'd been very business-like. She'd been very businesslike with Max Ernest, she thought. She told him where she'd hidden the magician's notebook, and she gave all him, she gave him all the information she, she had about the Midnight Sun. And she didn't say anything about his abandoning their mission or being a coward and a traitor. Somehow, with all the activity, she'd forgotten that she'd been the one to end their partnership. He didn't say much, much at all for a change, which was fine with her. Hopefully, he would be able to play it off like she was staying with him at least until the morning. Then, well, everyone would start looking for her. Probably. But would it be too late? She didn't see the limousine until it splashed to a stop in front of her, glistening with raindrops. As Cass waited, the driver got out and walked toward her, heedless of the storm. The driver was big and tall and shadowed in, the, in darkness, save for a pair of white gloves gleaming in the night. Was it Dr. L? Every instant Cass had told her, Cass had told her to run, but something that was not quite bravery and not quite fear and not quite the knowledge of Benjamin's plight kept her rooted to the spot. Miss Skelton, the voice. Miss Skelton, the voice was gruff, but not as deep as Cass expected. Expected. Yeah, that's me. She sa said Cass forcefully as she could. I'm Daisy. Daisy stepped into the light, revealing a decidedly unflower-like but indisputably female face. Without another word, she opened the limousine's back door and beckoned Cass. Um. Cass inside with a gloved hand. 
Reminding herself she is a celebrity and not the type of person to be intimidated by a limousine driver, even if the driver was the tallest woman she'd ever seen, Tess held her head high and climbed in as confidently as if she rode in the limo and limousines every day and Daisy were her own personal chauffeur. Only after she'd settled into her plush velvet seat did Cass notice how violently her hands were shaking. She had to sit on them to get them to stop. Hours passed in silence. Cass, Cass barely... Hours passed in silence, Cass barely able to see out of the foggy windows. Generally, she could tell they were heading upward, but the limousine made so many turns that she lost all sense of direction. Too late, she too late. She thought of Hansel and Gretel and how you're supposed to leave a trail of crumbs when you journey into a forest. If nobody came for her, how would she find her way back? She told herself to stay calm, but doubts kept creeping into her head. Previously, she'd been so focused. Fo focused. Oh my God. Previously, she'd been, so, she'd been so focused on getting into the midnight sun that she hadn't stopped to think what she would do once she got inside. Now that she appeared really to be on her way, she wondered how she would find Benjamin and how she would get him out. In the back of her mind lurked another darker question. Why had Dr. Ray and Miss, Dr. L and Miss Mauve take Benjamin? What did they want him for? What happened to the, what happened to the magicians? I can't talk today. I'm really sorry. What had happened to the magician's brother, Luciano? Would she find him, too, still a prisoner after so much time? He would be an old man by now, his circus days long gone. And what about the magician, Petro, himself? What was the terrible secret he had discovered? Was she strong enough to face it if she had to? Suddenly, the limousine rounded a turn and broke through the clouds. Cass wiped the fog off the window next to her and looked outside. The sky above now... The sky above was now clear and starry, suggestive no longer of ghost stories, but rather of science fiction and space travel. A perfect sky for spotting comets or for studying constellations, if only Cass had the time and inclination. Unfortunately, she had neither. Cass could tell, couldn't could tell much about their location except that they were near the top of a mountain. Below them, a vast white blanket of clouds, illuminated by the moon, spread out as far as she could see. <clears throat> The limousine made another sharp turn, then descended into a small hidden valley. Look, Daisy commanded, breaking the silence. Only then did Cass become aware of the warm glow suffocating the landscape around them. Craning her neck, she could just make out the source of a source out the source of the glow, an intense golden light peeking over the edge of the mountains. It looks like a sunrise, but it couldn't have been. The time was just before midnight. There it is, said Daisy, the midnight sun.